A former prosecutor and domestic violence advocate is the new chair of the State Board of Pardons and Parole. We're going to ask Erica Tyndall how her experiences might help the board make re-entry decisions. The Middle East and North Africa have erupted in revolution and resistance. We're going to talk about what the U.S. role is overseas. You're watching The Real Story. I'm Lori Perez. Governor Malloy has named our first guest as the new chair of the State Board of Pardons and Parole. It is a seat that carries an extraordinary load of responsibility and scrutiny as the public watches to make sure offenders are not released from prison without the proper amount of consideration and supervision. Erica Tyndall is the current executive director of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Before this, she was a state prosecutor out of Dade County in Florida. Thanks, Erica, for being here. Thank you. Congratulations on the appointment. Thank Thank you very much. Now, uh, my first question is, going from being a prosecutor, as someone who sends people to prison, to being the chair of this board who, you know, theoretically uh, could um, assist people in, in getting out of prison, I mean, is that, uh, is that opposite, or just, does it just sound like it is? Um, it's not opposite. Actually, your job as a prosecutor is to um, prove beyond a reasonable doubt that someone has committed the crimes, uh, the charges that are before you, but I actually had a step in between. I was a legal services attorney um, in New Haven for about 10 years, so okay. there was a step in between there, um, but always in the field of domestic violence. And, and theoretically, if you could, how, how do you think that someone earns the right to have early release? Well, we have to look at um, if we're over-incarcerating people. So sentences have to be, charges have to be appropriate, sentences have to be appropriate. And for those offenders for whom they can successfully re-engage in the community, there can be supervision put in place that makes that um, a safe thing for the public, something that's acceptable uh, to a victim, and we can save money as a, as a state as well. So all of those things will come into play in our decision making. Right, and all of those things I know are, are widely debated, particularly um, the super supervision aspect of it, yes. and also helping um, the parolees or, or people who have completed their sentence to make a successful re-entry. I mean, what sorts of things uh, do you think that we could improve on? Well, we need to look at uh, the population of offenders and see what appropriate supervisions can be put in place. We have about 17,670 inmates right now, I believe currently in Connecticut, 1,000 are women, 30% of them have mental health issues. So looking at those various uh, populations, how many of them have committed nonviolent crimes or crimes that we can feel comfortable with certain criteria releasing back into the community? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to re-engage with the community, re-entry? Um, are we giving the appropriate supports um, and, and information sharing around that so that the decisions are informed and responsible decisions? Right, and that's something that really came under fire, especially after the Cheshire Home Invasion. Yes. And uh, people were concerned about the lack of information that apparently had been, had been shared between the courts and the Board of Parole. And I know that the uh, legislature has approved... Um, a new IT system, but that's kind of been held up, in, at least in terms of funding. And what's your understanding right. of how that's going to be? My understanding is that that uh, CJIS, the Criminal Justice Information System, uh, Governor Malloy has proposed uh, $8 million uh, in bonding for that, and, and that will enable the various criminal justice um, policy organizations to be able to information share, and we have immediate access to the information that we need. Um, and that's really key. And, you know, it's my understanding of what happened uh, after the 2006 seven um, murders, uh, that one of the problems was uh, information. Um, of course, you know, we're human. We're, you know, not infallible, but the thing to do is to make sure that we have all of the available information and resources to make those decisions. And you can't go wrong if you have the right criteria. And I mean, is it decisions. something just as simple as, as having you know, computer access to the records, or is it beyond um, that? It's beyond that, and, and simple is not an adjective I think I would use with this process. This is um, an awesome responsibility. Um, you know, there's professional staff that have lots of experience, and I think everyone is really interested in the same thing, and public yeah. safety, and um, my perspective that I will bring will be a victim perspective as well um, as the criminal justice side, the prosecutorial perspective, but I have a lot of experience 
understanding uh, what crime victims need in this process and how the criminal justice system can respond to that. And so I'm looking very forward to being able to bring some of that experience to this job. How do you think that your expertise um, as an advocate for domestic violence and your awareness of, of why that occurs and, and mm. how, why sometimes it reoccurs, how do you think that that will affect uh, your personal decisions about who should be? I mean, do you think you'll be harder on people who've been involved in domestic violence? Uh, no, I don't think I'll be harder. I, one of the advantages of having a domestic violence uh, advocacy background and legal background is that you know, understanding the complexities and the dynamics of intimate partner violence um, gives you a view into, you know, offender accountability and what is going to rehabilitate someone or who simply cannot be re rehabilitated um, from the perspective of what victims need out of the process. Mm -hmm. That's something that I think um, domestic violence, you know, prosecutors and, and you know, lawyers who specialize in, in family law have a very unique perspective in that sense. So I think that'll be very helpful in my new job. So who might be an example or what might be a situation where uh, you would not believe that someone might be a candidate for rehabilitation? I mean, in your experience at, at the domestic violence. Um, oh, there's lots of examples <laughs> um, of domestic violence. Or, or, and you know, conversely, when do they traditionally have success? Well, um, early intervention, clearly, um, preventative measures, and again, the whole re the idea of reentry and reengagement in the community is about looking at what is going to prevent this person from recidivating. Mm -hmm. And so, because in the domestic violence arena, we deal with trauma. Um, and how humans respond to traumatic events. And we know that many offenders, even if they are not incarcerated for domestic violence crimes, or but that behavior, that acting out, um, that uh, translation into uh, criminal activity is a result of trauma and, and similar risk factors that, that um, we see in terms of looking at preventing domestic violence. So I'm you know, very well versed in all of those. and. Uh, that would be very helpful. Do you think you've made successes or gains um, in your time at uh, CCADV so far? Of course I think so. <laughs> um, you'll have to ask uh, others really what they think. Um, we have uh, really looked carefully at a strategic um, planning process and how the coalition as a network, meaning the East Hartford, Hartford office as well as the 18 member programs across the state can um, really respond to what we're seeing uh, in Connecticut in terms of domestic violence offenses. We're looking at prevention, we're looking at more public awareness, we're looking at uh, community investment and creating a culture of intolerance for uh, domestic violence. And so what we are doing is letting everyone know that you have a role, that bystanders have a role, that neighbors have a role, that teachers, that... Um, and so we were, we're really uh, moving in, in a good direction and um, I am uh, proud of what has been done in the last uh, two years of my tenure and as well as what the organization has been able to accomplish in, in the years since its establishment and I'm, you know, I'm always rooting for, for the coalition. Right. Aren't you uh, worried about this? I mean, aren't you worried that perhaps in your new role that the board, God forbid, would, would make a wrong decision? And... Um, am I worried about it? I think that, um, I think that someone that gets let out may do some harm. Mm -hmm. And I think that my job is to make sure that we are prepared as best we can be to prevent that from happening, mm -hmm. um, that we are doing everything that we are able to do to ensure that it doesn't, but ultimately that responsibility will be with the offender. And, and the thing is, you know, you can sentence someone to 20 years in prison or 10 years or five years in prison, and once they have completed that sentence, you have to let them go. Right. End of sentence um, offenders get out and re-engage in the community without supervision. So it behooves us as a community um, to, when we are considering who to let out and when, that we make sure that, you know, a plan is in place, that we're doing proper risk assessments and lethality assessments and but you know um, assuming we have the money to keep everyone incarcerated they got to get out right. at some point and so um, this is about uh, public safety and and responsible informed decisions all right well we wish you good luck thank you i'll need it thank you <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. you she's erica tyndall she's the new chair of the state board of pardons and parole now coming up next unrest abroad is causing concerns here at home we're going to talk to scott bates who met with congressman chris murphy this week earlier a few days ago to talk about u.s foreign policy thanks eric